Tell me to go, and then I will. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Um, I'm going to start with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and the Boomerang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose lands I live, work, and research. I also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation on whose lands I was born, and the Darumbal people on whose lands I was raised. I further acknowledge all First Nations people in the lands where I travel and work and research. I acknowledge their unceded sovereignty. I pay my deepest respects to our land's ancient and living culture, acknowledging the triumphs and struggles of the ancestral elders and honouring the elders and culture today. It always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Woman Jika, everyone, welcome, uh, particularly to our first year students who start next week. Um, you'll get used to hearing that acknowledgement of country. It's something that we take very seriously here at RMIT. So you're going to hear all sorts of variations on it and everyone's going to acknowledge their personal journey towards reconciliation. So um, come prepared. <laughs> if you haven't already Googled the lands that you come from, it's worth doing. Um, so now some introductions. Firstly, Bill Grinsky, who you've all, you've all come to see, is a professor of pres professional practice at Columbia University in New York. Andrea Ho, who's the director of education from the Judith Nielsen Institute for Journalism and Ideas. Students, graduates from the five universities teaching journalism in Melbourne, including RMIT, and staff from RMIT's journalism and politics program, Dr. Lucy Morrison, Dr. Stephanie Marquidas, Associate Professor Kathy Greenfield and Janet Rogers and, um, and a particular call out to our graduates. Bill is the first Alan Moorhead journalist in residence at the Judith Nielsen Institute, the international stream of JNI's journalist in residence program. He's been researching the impact of the news media bargaining code one year on from implementation. His career includes senior print and online editing roles, as well as six years as an academic dean at Columbia Journalism School. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and his career has taken him from a reporter at the Daily American in Rome and the founding editor of the weekly Dakota Sun on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation in North Dakota to the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. And he oversaw the staff during and after the September 11 attacks on the World Trade Center, which was right next door to the World <laughs> Wall Street Journal's offices. Um, while he was at the Wall Street Journal, the number of subscribers doubled to more than 1 million and the site introduced blogs, interactive graphics and video. He's been at Columbia since 2008 and over that time has overseen a dramatic transformation of the curriculum designed to give students more flexibility to focus on skills ranging from video to data visualization to long form digital journalism, all the stuff that you'll learn here at RMIT. He's also authored the story so far, what we know about the business of digital journalism. In 2014, he was named an executive editor at Bloomberg with whom we have mentoring relationships. So again, another organisation that you'll get to know through this program. And he's overseen the efforts to train global news staff to reach broader audiences across digital platforms. He has a BA in classics from Stanford University and an MA in international economics and US foreign policy from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Wow, that is quite an impressive resume. I'm really old. <laughs> Please welcome to RMIT. The floor is yours, Bill. <laughs> Hi. So you want me to sit here for the camera? Is that right? Yes, please. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I have prepared remarks, and I think I'm going to deliver them. 
But I, I'm also very cognizant that as we're speaking right now, there's a war going on a few thousand miles from here and a pretty devastating one. So I'm going to try to keep the remarks a little bit tighter than I was going to make them. And if you all want to talk about that or about anything else later on, you can also do what students at Columbia do all the time, which is interrupt me when I'm in the middle of something, which is fine because it kind of keeps things going. Um, um, but um, the point of my remarks today is to talk about the use of social media by journalists, especially young journalists. And I don't know how much this has crossed your, your, your radar, but if, if, if it hasn't so far, it's going to. OK, so um, I actually want to, uh, you know, journalists love anecdotes. So I want to tell this through the stories of two journalists. Um, one is a reporter who was stationed in Baghdad in 2004 uh, during some of the bloodiest months in the Iraq war. Uh, and another is a very young journalist, uh, 22, who worked briefly for the Associated Press until she became the target of uh, a hate campaign on social media because of a few of her tweets. Both of them use digital means outside their own news organizations to express their opinions and analysis, and both of them came under very intense scrutiny for doing so. And if we look at both cases, we're going to learn a lot, I think, about how technology has changed the role of journalists. And but also speaks to the whole idea of being an objective journalist as well. So let's start with the first reporter. Fall 2004, as the US invasion of Iraq was veering dangerously off, off course, the journal's Baghdad bureau chief named Farnaz Fasihi sent what she thought was a private email to just a few of her friends. I'm going to quote it at some length today because her passion and, and eloquence are important. Quote, being a foreign correspondent in Baghdad these days is like being under virtual house arrest. My most pressing concern every day is not to write a kick-ass story, but just to stay alive and make sure our employees stay alive. In detail after, uh, so keep in mind, this is a private email that she sent to just a few friends. In detail after detail, she showed how American policy was going off, off kilter. The, ins the insurgency is rampant with no signs of, of calming down. If anything, it's growing stronger, more organized, and more sophisticated. Police are being murdered by the dozens every day. Then she used what she thought was the comfort zone of a private email to go beyond a standard journalistic practice. Quote, despite President Bush's rosy assessments, she wrote, Iraq is a disaster. If under Saddam, it was a potential threat under the Americans it has been transformed to an imminent and active threat. She called the war, quote, a foreign policy failure bound to haunt the United States for decades to come. As I said, she wrote this just for a close circle of friends, something she'd been doing for several years ever since the September 11th attacks. Now, keep in mind, this is 2004, so social media was very different from what it looks like right now. Mark Zuckerberg was still a student at Harvard University. Twitter hadn't, hadn't come on the scene yet. But something happened with this email. It's something that Fasihi didn't anticipate. The digital platform acted as an accelerant, providing fuel to the spark of her unsparing prose. That, combined with her status as a reporter for the Wall Street Journal covering a controversial war, just months after a hotly contested presidential election, ensured that her, me, her uh, email would move far beyond the small group that she, that she uh, intended to reach. People started forwarding that email to others because it was such an honest and brutal account, something that they hadn't read elsewhere. It took a few, me it took a few weeks, but eventually this private email would be published on blogs and websites all around the world. An electronic letter meant for just a few friends became a must read for hundreds of thousands of people. Nothing I, I've ever done had ever gone viral like that, she told me years later. I did an interview her a few years ago. Suddenly, I was getting emails. I swear this is a direct quote from as far away as Australia. Um, a lot of us found the email really compelling truth telling. At the time, a press critic and a professor at New York University, Jay Rosen, wrote, it's really journalism and eyewitness report giving impressions and conclusions about Iraq. It's not intended for the public but that doesn't mean that it's not fit for public consumption. A, a prominent blogger named Andrew Sullivan wrote, is this re reporter biased? Maybe. Is that bad? I don't think so. Is she making it up? I really doubt it. But the reaction from conservatives and right wing uh, commentators, especially in the United States, uh, was very different. One of them wrote, my suspicion is this woman is in over her head and terrified by the danger facing journalists in Baghdad. And for many, the reference to President Bush's uh, policy seemed unprofessional for an objective reporter. Um, now, to their credit, the, the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal took her side. He, he said to the New York Post, her private opinions have in no way distorted her coverage. 
He went on to command to commend her track record as a model of intelligent and courageous reporting. And it proved not to be a huge obstacle to her career. Years since she wrote that email, she returned as a correspondent to Iran, to Lebanon, and other volatile zones in the Middle East. She, she, she's now at the New York Times, where she continues to cover some of the most important stories in the world. She also went on to write a book about the Iraq War. And in the foreword of the book, she noted how that email had become a catalyst for her own feelings. Quote, because I was writing just to my friends, I spoke freely without the restraints of daily journalism that obliged me to be distant and objective. The emotional and personal tone grabbed the public in a way that my published journalism for the newspaper rarely did. The reaction overwhelmed me. Strangers wrote to me asking, is it really that bad in Iraq? We had no idea. I want to reread part of what she said. The restraints of daily journalism obliged me to be distant and objective. She felt there was no room for this personal tone that would affect readers in ways that standard journalism can't match. I was the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal's online site at the time, and I was involved only in so far as I was the recipient of many emails from readers, a lot of which were stirred up on conservative websites. I was glad the journal didn't take punitive action against her and was relieved that she would soon return to the Middle East. So that's one case, 2004. I want to talk now about a much more recent case, one that happened just last year. A young woman named Emily Wilder, 20, who at the time was a 22-year-old news assistant working at the Associated Press Bureau in Phoenix, Arizona, in the southwestern United States. Right around the time the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict was heating up last year, Israeli forces blew up a building in, in Gaza that happened to house the Associated Press's local headquarters. They claimed that it also housed Hamas military intelligence. That next day, Wilder tweeted this, Quote, objectivity feels fickle when the basic terms we use to report news implicitly state a claim, saying Israel but not Palestine, or war but not siege and occupation or political choices. Right after that, some conservative students at her alma mater, Stanford University, found some of her old posts and, and tweets, including several that were sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. That got weaponized by right-wing outlets and politicians. The Associated Press had, decided to fire her almost immediately, saying she had violated their social media policy. Within days later, Emily Wilder, keep in mind, a 22-year-old journalist just starting her career, fired back on Twitter, criticizing the Associated Press for its willingness to, as she put it, sacrifice those with the least power to the cruel trolling of a group of anonymous bullies. Many journalists, including over 150 colleagues at the Associated Press, took the AP to task for how it handled the case. And the more the Associated Press tried to explain what they did, the more absurd their decision to fire this young reporter seemed. One reason she had to go, a top editor told CNN, was because her impartiality might have been compromised if, well, if she ever had to cover a demonstration about the Middle East in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> the AP's decision to fire her became a case study in how a large news organization can struggle to adapt its social media policies to the new age as editors seek the traffic and attention that social media bring, but fail to recognize the consequences. As for Wilder, her own Twitter following exploded. She, before this happened, she had around 1,000 followers. Now she has 91,000. So what do we say? What does this tell us about how reporters should conduct our, our, ourselves in, in this era? It's a long-standing tenet of journalism that reporters should be objective observers, acting as handmaidens of facts, for our readers and just let them make their own informed decisions. Now, that doesn't mean that journalists never should provide analysis or just give readers a recitation of, of opposing sides. If anything, it's become increasingly important for reporters to play a larger role in explaining and analyzing what's going on. Still, it's not simple. It never was, and in the digital age, it's more difficult than ever. Um, in 2004, it took a few weeks for Farnaz Fasihi's email to be distributed and eventually published online. In 2021, it took a few minutes for Emily Wilder's tweets to be read and retweeted endlessly. So let's remember that reporters, especially those working for big news organizations, have an obligation to the institution. They get paid, they get health benefits, or, although I guess in Australia you get government health, so that's good. Um, but there's also two things that the journalists get that are really important, access and an audience. When Emily Wilder arrived in Arizona's young AP reporter, she was instantaneously able to reach a global audience, one that her news organization had worked tirelessly for decades to build. 
So in that sense, doesn't the balance of power seem clear? Reporters have usually owed a total allegiance to their editors and their bosses until they move on to a different newspaper or website or TV station. For good reasons, many publishers have found it necessary to continue to exercise their authority over their reporters' use of social media. But as times have changed, so have their policies. The Washington Post, for example, used to say that reporters and editors must relinquish the privileges of private citizens and recognize that any uh, content associated with them in an online social network is for all practical purposes, the equivalent of what appears under their bylines. Now they've scaled that back. And now the Washington Post social media policy says simply that journalists must reflect upon the reputation and credibility of the newsroom and be mindful of preserving our reputation for independence. So what we see right now is a really interesting effort by journalism institutions to retain their credibility among citizens, in part because they believe it helps them stay relevant. So in that way, I want you to think about this. Even as newsrooms seek to preserve the traditional lines of conduct by their reporters, is it still so clear where the institutions reach ends and the reporter's responsibility begins? Um, I'm always wary of saying digital changes everything, but I think this is one of those cases where it really does. Institutions themselves, newsrooms are under increasing financial pressure, and that makes this all really murky. Newsrooms find it necessary to drive more and more traffic to their websites. Social media has to be part of that mix. The reporters are being encouraged to use Twitter and Facebook and uh, Instagram and other platforms in ways that draw bigger audiences and drive more usage. But many users of social media find they have to be provocative to be successful. Being provocative means that some of your tweets and posts are going to go awry. Also, encouraging this direct relationship between journalists and readers requires rethinking traditional rules about how reporters are being edited and supervised. At, at most no news organizations, what you write is going to be edited by at least one editor and hopefully more. Not so with social media posts, they go right up. And then there's another issue, one that goes even more directly to the tense relationship between reporters and their bosses. Reporters' reputations um, and their market value depend increasingly on their ability to attract an audience. Now, for people who got in the business years ago, that's hard to understand. For, for years, journalists haven't cared that much about how many people read or watched our stories. We were all members of a team and it was hard to determine how much any individual journalist contributed. But now those metrics are much easier to measure. Most newsrooms, and some of you have, may have been in them, can find out exactly how many page views every story is getting at like any minute of the day. And finally, most reporters are largely anonymous to the outside world. The name of who's covering the police department or the school system is largely unknown to anyone who isn't already a source. But now your audience can be determined constantly and, and uh, instantly. And the number of followers that you have can have a big impact on the kind of market value, salary, and job that you'll get. So reporters in the digital world have a different and expanding set of obligations to fulfill. It's not enough to just cover a beat or produce a video or, or write a good story. Um, you also have to build out a social media presence. And they have another obligation as, as well. They have a duty to themselves to build up their presence online, to prove to employers present and future that they can build and sustain an audience. So here's why that's scary for news organizations. Thanks to social media, a reporter's audience is largely movable. You think about how different that is. In the old days, a reporter would leave a news organization nobody would notice. But now a journalist is building their own brand is in a very different category. Some American journalists have two, three, or four million Twitter followers. Australia is a smaller market, but many top TV anchors and personalities have hundreds of thousands of followers. When you pick up and leave that news organization, those followers don't stay at the organization. They come with you wherever you go, and you suddenly have a portable audience. The message is getting through to reporters. I, I talked to Farnaz Fasihi, the author of that Iraq email not too long ago, and I asked her about this, this trend. And she says that she does use Twitter to post stories about what's going on to, to find and contact sources. She isn't there to provide unvarnished opinions. But several years ago when Iran was back in the news, a journal editor told her that her name had become, quote, one of the most searched terms on the Wall Street Journal website. That's when it occurred to her. We're, we're turning into brands. I don't know if that's a good thing or, or, or a bad thing, but it means I have a power to increase my own audience. 
but it, it, it's clearly a bad thing in some ways, she said. Some of the brands are, are overstressed. Reporters now spend hours trying to figure out how to time their tweets or when to send them overnight. That's not why I became a journalist, she told me. I didn't become a reporter to become a celebrity. I became a reporter to have real interaction with the world, not the virtual world. That makes a lot of sense. As powerful as social media has become, it can't substitute for the vital acts of journalism that reporters commit daily in, in many parts of the world, including Ukraine right now, courageously. But it's also important not to see it as an either or proposition. Social media can be seen as a journalistic tool, no less vital than a phone or a camera. And with any tool, journalists need guidelines. Chief among them is that reporters must understand that a social media post can be as powerful as any story they write or any video they produce. Emily Wilder, that young reporter in Arizona, will be associated with her tweets for years whenever someone Googles her name, for better or worse. So every time a reporter sends out a tweet or puts, puts something up on Instagram or TikTok, the self-editor must engage. It also means that reporters must closely examine who they are and what role they want to play. If your intention is to be an advocate for one side while downplaying or ignoring contradictory evidence, so be it. There are many examples of, of, uh, of reporters acting in that mode. But you have to recognize the implications of that. You might be diminishing your potential audience, preaching only to the converted. You're likely cutting yourself off from sources who feel that they're not going to get a fair hearing from you. More fundamentally, you might be failing to invite or consider opinions and facts that will make your own journalism more authentic. For those who value the search for truth, the search unencumbered by the obligation to satisfy a point of view, I would just say this. Whatever you write, whatever you say has now become a part of how your reporting will be viewed. You cannot separate your tweets or posts from your articles or your broadcasts. And the sooner you see your social media as integral to your journalism and not a sideline, the more easily you can adapt to the new possibilities and risks. When I began researching the speech, I took the time to reread Farnaz Fasihi's 2004 email from Iraq. It, it really is a piece of journalism. It isn't just opinion. And with minor editing, it really should have run in the Wall Street Journal. It's a journal's loss that she felt too constrained to offer it to editors like me. And it's the world's loss that her message had to be spread as if it were some piece of contraband shared by insiders rather than a published depiction of events that deserved widespread attention and acclaim. So I asked her how years later did she view that email that she had sent from Baghdad? And here's what she told me, and I'm gonna end my remarks with her. Things have changed a lot. In 2004, I didn't have a direct audience as we have now with Twitter. Now the conversation becomes public. You're much more conscious that whatever you say is not private. There's something about technology, there's an intimacy to it that makes you forget it's a public domain. You can mistake it for a conversation with a friend. And as for the email itself, she told me this. Though it was difficult, I don't re regret writing it or sending it. As a journalist, ultimately what you try to do is to have impact. You try to get people to see things in a different way. And my email succeeded in doing that. And that's the end of this. So. <laughs> I'll get rid of that. Um, so um, I'm happy to chat about any of that or about anything else that's on your mind right now. Sure. Jeremy, I'm just going to pass this because we've got people who are actually watching online, believe it or not. So but, uh, what you say I will be tweeted endlessly around the world. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, how fun. Okay. Um, and I, and uh, when you ask, um, can you tell me who you are and yeah. w where you are in your... Sure thing. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gunn. I recently graduated from here, RMIT Journalism. Oh, great. Um, I just have a question. Um, you just now mentioned about how many journalists are kind of creating their own little brand through social right. media, right? And how many of their tweets and posts are basically connected to your own journalism. Is it a new thing? Because I was thinking about how even in the past, we already had kind of journalists and writers as brands. I mean, Hunter S. Thompson is one, and yeah. um, Ernest Hemingway was another, right? right? Or Susan Orlean as another. Yeah, kind of, well, those are great examples. Right? Mm -hmm. And do you think it's kind of a new thing, or do you think it's just kind of becoming more commonplace with social um, media? Well, that's an, those are three really interesting names, and they're all people, I guess they're all American journalists who who have a real, who had a real identity uh, because of the way they wrote and the way they reported things. I would say 
Um, there's two things that are different. One is what it took somebody like Susan Orlean to kind of build that identity was a long process of many articles and books. Um, um, there's a great documentary about Hemingway, since you mentioned him, about his long struggles. Uh, he started off as a reporter for the Kansas City Star, and he, he's still, um, well, still, he's been dead for a long time, but um, but uh, but he he attributed his writing style to the old Kansas Star, uh, the old Kansas City Star writing rules, which you can Google, and they're actually outside of a couple racist things, very good. But um, but it took them a long time to sort of get the kind of notoriety that they did. Um, and so if um, when you compare that, say, Emily Wilder, the young reporter from the AP, who suddenly has 100,000 followers, all because of really one or two tweets and the way the AP reacted to her. So um, I think you're absolutely right that journalists, there have always been certain journalists who have achieved kind of fame that kind of goes even beyond their work. I think what's different now is that the speed of that happening and the reasons for it happening have, have kind of changed quite a bit. So what you're basically saying that it's the many personal journalists rise is are a bit more caustic rather than kind of a gradual. Yeah, ascent. and that it sort of ebbs and flows. And so somebody who is famous now, a year from now, maybe you will, you know, Nabu will remember who uh, he or she is. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring this over to Dr. Lucy Morrison. Here you go, Lucy. No. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I'm Lucy. I am actually a graduate of the journalism program and now teaching into it okay. uh, in the politics minor. Um, I'm interested in the way in which Twitter then also becomes a news feed for people. And so, for instance, you know, maybe when there's an event happening like now in Ukraine or during the Trump presidency, you, you, well, I mean, I often go to Twitter first um, to see what's happening and to get that sense of immediacy. And so I'm kind of interested in how that may impact on news values and um, particularly, you, you know, the, the kind of the order of information, the prominence of certain stories, um, and, and whether there's any, um, in your experience or to your knowledge, any kind of negotiation between a newsroom and the editorial team and the journalists about what can go on Twitter and what can't to get any control of that information and and, um, and the kind of, yeah, the, the order of it, or if it's just, if that just becomes a much more kind of open um, free for all with the journalists on Twitter determining the, the news cycle rather than the kind of values and, and editorial structures? So I would say, <clears throat> I mean, certainly if you look at what's going on in y Ukraine right now, if you really want to know what's going on, it's impossible not to be on Twitter because there's just, you know, and obviously there's some risks because there's people posting things who don't know what they're talking about or they're actually posting intentional misinformation. But if you can find a list or a filter of people who are really good, it's, it's, it's really important. I can almost guarantee you none of those tweets, certainly by people on the ground, but also by reporters in Canberra or Washington DC or, or Paris are, are being edited by, by anyone except for the person writing them. And um, so, you know, when you think about it, it kind of changes the whole dynamic of how a reporter has traditionally gone around writing and, you know, and submitting a story you know, often there's a commissioning process and then they report it and then they write it and then they send it up to New York or London or Sydney or wherever and then gets edited and finally gets published. And now, boom, it's just out there, you know. And so, um, and if you're a reporter covering Ukraine and if you're not part of that, then I think that you're really missing something. So I also think just as kind of a time management issue, you know, it can, I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, but it, it can be very easy to get very caught up in it, you know, um, and there'll be all these kind of sideline disputes where somebody will say something stupid or abhorrent and then everybody has to pile on and then everybody has to agree with the people who are piling on. Before you know it, you've lost 25 minutes of your day and you still have a 9 p.m. deadline. And so I, I think it requires a certain amount of self-restraint as as well. Some newsrooms are becoming much more sophisticated where they have social media teams who are monitoring it and who can who can help a reporter feed through it and that kind of thing. So. 
Sorry, I've got I've got the mic now, Bill. Hi, Andrea Ho. I'm with the Judith Nielsen Institute, so I'm travelling with Bill, but I'm actually an alumnus. I, I completed the RMIT journalism program pre-social media, which is probably about a thousand years ago now. Um, just following on from your question, Lucy, I guess I would then ask you, Bill, what, how would you restructure the newsroom um, hierarchy or environment today because the role of subs, as Lucy, I guess, kind of has indicated, isn't to correct people's spelling anymore or do the quick fact check uh, or it's, you know, that that isn't happening in the same way anymore. But at the same time, you could look at a lot of tweets that go out there and you wish that a sub had run their eyes over them because they're the things that get journalists into trouble, that intemperate uh, kind of um, off the cuff comment, I suppose. But the old structures don't work anymore because of the way that our digital world has changed. So mm -hmm. how would you as a former editor restructure the uh, subbing process within a newsroom? Um, I would probably do it more as a training thing than a, than a, than a I would say it more as a training issue than as an editing issue because, um, and so by that I mean, you would really, you know, when you hire somebody or when you promote somebody to a more high profile beat, you would want to really train them in terms of kind of thinking through the implications of social media. And, you know, and I I hope the remarks I gave didn't put a total nimbus cloud over the whole thing. I, I think it's an incredibly powerful and useful medium, you know. Um, uh, and so I to me, the, the kind of point is not to sit there and trying to edit all of your reporters' tweets because, A, most newsrooms are have a lot fewer editors than they used to, and, 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 uh, and B, you would lose the immediacy of a lot of it. And the truth is some reporters are really good at Twitter, and you can see their personality come through, whether it's their humor or their insight or their analysis. And if you run that through some kind of editing colander or, or mesh, or filter, you might end up losing a lot of what would make it good. I think there's a question down here. Oh, excellent. I, I thought I saw a hand go up. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my thought is like, especially social media is like Instagram are very personal. And so right. it's obviously a really great tool, but is there any like, is there any like do's or don'ts with like how far you can make it personal, for example, because like, especially like females on Instagram, not to like play that card, but like tend to feel like they need to be like attractive and in some way. And there's just a line of like professional that I can't imagine those kind of posts reach. So like, where's like the line of personal versus professional on yeah. those kind of social platforms? Yeah, no, I think that's, um, I mean, first of all, there's a whole, issue around and especially for women whether they're journalists or they have normal jobs um there's a whole issue around abuse and invective and that kind of thing and that's something that i think is also um i know there's a little off your topic but that's another place where newsrooms need to be really uh proactive in terms of protecting their staff you know sometimes helping them understand what kind of tweets might might lead to that, but I want to be really careful. It, it doesn't take much for a misogynist or a racist to start piling on to somebody, even if it's the most, you know, anodyne objective tweet. The, if they don't like what you have to say, then they're just going to pile on. Um, I know some journalists have uh, personal Instagram accounts that are actually not under their actual name. Uh, and their private accounts so they can keep it to their friends. And this, and sometimes it's a matter of, you know, they want to post pictures of their kids or their family. And, you know, if you're covering a high profile beat these days, I don't know, maybe it's not as bad in Australia as it is in the United States, but a lot of reporters will get doxxed. Do you know what doxxed means? Where somebody will look up what your private information is and they'll post your like home address and your, your cell phone number and that kind of thing, and your life turns into a living hell. So I think um, a number of reporters I know have personal Instagram accounts that have a different name and they're locked and that kind of thing. That way they can still feel comfortable sharing baby pictures or pet pictures or vacation pictures or something like that. Then they may have a separate professional account where they're simply posting 
uh, images that are related to the journalism that they're doing. Hi, Bill. Um, hi. hi, I'm Steph. I'm a, um, a lecturer in the journalism department. Um, I really liked this quote, and maybe it's not a direct quote, but it's you before, um, saying that that email was not intended for the public, but it was still fit for public consumption. Yeah. And, and then we're talking about sort of Twitter and all of this stuff that is intended for the public, but also maybe not fit for public consumption in that uh -huh. there's a lot yeah. out there that uh -huh. maybe you don't want to waste 25 minutes of your day, right. you know? And so it's making me think about this relationship between the publication and the reader and that interactivity and how, as you said, it's really swung around since 2004, right. yeah? What do you foresee in terms of that relationship? Where's that going? Are we still going to be just, you know, these open, mouthpieces for whatever comes through our heads is it going to retract a bit i don't know what's what are your thoughts um are you talking about for people in the news business for, i'm sort of yeah i'm interested or? in people in the news business yeah. but i'm also sorry it's a double edge but i'm also interested in in the in the conversation that generates from you know yeah. from the readers but yeah however you want to take it um so i'll caution that my perspective is a very American one. I've only been in Australia for the three or four weeks. Um, what's happened in America is that discussion has become so heavily polarized around um, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, uh, other lines that um, what we're actually seeing, I think, is um, uh, kind of a blowing up of a kind of common public forum for stuff. So like Donald Trump has started his own um, the social media platform. I don't know how it's going to do, but um, uh, if you look at the, the top the Facebook posts from um, from United States readers, um, nine out of 10 every day are from really right wing websites. I mean, websites that make Rupert Murdoch look like a centrist, you know, I mean, <laughs> really, really, you know, um, and uh, and so we're seeing kind of people go off into their camps and at least Facebook, their whole business model is kind of predicated on that, that um, uh, that that they what what Facebook wants is for you to spend as many seconds of the day as possible on their platform. And the thing that will um, do that most effectively is not by surfacing posts that might challenge your conventional wisdom and make you think, huh, maybe I was wrong about that. No, it's just the opposite. It's stuff that actually kind of feeds into that and incites it. Um, I was on an airplane not too long ago and I watched a woman who was older than me, so she was really old. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and she had her uh, iPad and she had Facebook up and she spent two hours just scrolling through Facebook. Like, I mean, I'd never seen, I mean, I. I've never seen people read a book as closely as she was reading, but she was just totally absorbed. I was kind of peeking over and there were all these crazy posts about uh, Trump. And I don't know if this was during COVID, but it had to do with all these kind of crazy health. It was all this conspiracy theory stuff. And she was just kind of reading it like somebody was reading the New York Times or just Sydney Morning Herald, just like, you know. Um, and I was just thinking, well, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, this is your favorite customer, right? Because also every second you spend on Facebook, they're collecting data and they can provide ads that are more effective and they make a lot more money and all that. I don't want to go into the whole thing, but so I, so that to me is kind of what's happening. I think it's a really problematic thing for us in the journalism business. Sorry. Just before we go to the students, my name is Vicky and I'm a journalist and teach at RMIT in other areas, but um, my question is, around the young ones. The young ones here have grown up with all this. Right. So what's the one one really strong tip you'd give them? Because it's sort of the world they're in. So from a journalistic perspective, what's one thing that you would tell them to be aware of or to do, you know, in that term? Um, well, it's kind of what, um, I guess it's kind of a point I tried to get across in my earlier 
remarks, which is to be very respectful of the power of social media, um, the power both to you know distribute your journalism and and to find new sources, and also to be very cognizant of the power it can uh, have to you know make mincemeat of your life for a little while. You know, there's. There was, there was a famous story about eight or ten years ago. There was a woman who was getting on a plane to Africa. Some of you, any of you know this story? Anyway, she like did a tweet. She said, I'm going to Africa. I think she said, I, I hope I don't catch AIDS or something. <laughs> and then she turned off her phone, got on the plane, arrived in Johannesburg or Cape Town eight or ten hours later. Boom. I mean, there's a woman like nobody ever. She was like a PR person for some mid-level company. No, but it, it, this is not a U.S. senator or prime minister. She got the plane and basically the world was over for her. I mean, it was a really stupid tweet and kind of racist and, you know, um, and, uh, you know, that that became in those days kind of exhibit A of the sort of power. But, you know, I, again, I want to really stress it really is a double edged sword in in the positive ways too, that you can find voices on social media that would otherwise take you a really long time to find. And you can find sources of expertise, people who really know about how COVID vaccines work, people who really understand what Ukraine's history is, people who really get what's happening to the, to the price of petrol right now. Um, and these people are 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 also on there. And as a journalist, they can be incredibly valuable. And and if you reach out to them on social media, very often they're really accessible and they're happy to talk to you and give you really great quotes and insight. Hi again. Um, Hi. Hi again. <laughs> you keep mentioning like Trump and his yeah. influence on social media. And right. I think um, like we all know kind of what happened with the storming of the Capitol and his like influence on social media very much like egged that on and that was very much a really good example of like the negative impact of power, people with power using social media. As journalists, do you believe that like that can also happen for them, like for journalists being like hit that side of like a negative influence and how do you see those people or see it within yourself and manage to not, <laughs> obviously we're not going to go to the extent of Trump, but like yeah. manage the power of social media and stop the negative turn that it can possibly have with that as a journalist or uh -huh. budding, et cetera. Um, so I think uh, every time you're about to do a post, you want to turn that self editor on. And, you know, there's no post that's so urgent that you can't copy and paste it and send it to a friend, a professor and an editor. Um, you know, and just say, how does this read to you? You know, uh, especially if you're trying to be funny or clever or, or ironic. I mean, irony doesn't always translate very well on Twitter. And so something that you think is really clever and you have a really smart insight on something. And, and again, people are going to take things wrong no matter what you say, you know, so you, you, you can kind of overly edit yourself. But um, uh, I've, I've had people, including students or journalists, send me something like this is something I'm thinking about posting. What do you think? And, you know, it can be a second pair of eyes almost always helps something like that. Hi again. Hey, hey. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to ask, um, when you were talking, you talked about how um, the reporter's email was quite emotional yeah. in tone, right? And it was very different from her reporting work. <laughs> right. uh, and you kind of talked about um, the place of of emotions and objectivity in journalism. And, you know, here in Australia, and I'm pretty sure most people here uh, will agree, is that a lot of Australian newsrooms doesn't really do a lot of emotional storytelling right. like the New Yorker or the Times would right. do. Yeah. Rather, it, it tends to be very kind of emotionless, yeah. right? And really the only place you're able to find that type of stuff is maybe the monthly, and that's right. kind of it. Right. And but what's kind of what do you think is kind of the boundary between kind of emotional storytelling and objectivity and kind of do you do they do you think that they kind of belong together or do you think that they should be completely separate yeah i mean um well that's a really good question 
I mean, it's like hard to just kind of lay down uh, like hard and fast rule, but um, um, if you ever want to read one of the greatest pieces of journalism ever done, um, a guy named John Hersey went to Hiroshima about a year after the atom bomb, maybe two years, and he wrote a piece for the New Yorker, um, which actually ended up taking up the entire magazine. I think it's one of only two or three times that they've done that. And I don't know if you all assign it here, but it's um, there's there's kind of a quiet emotion to it. Um, I mean, it's just vivid detail and re reporting. I mean, just imagine going to a city that a year or two earlier had been, much of it had been obliterated by a, a bomb the size of which humankind had never even imagined before. And, you know, a lot of it was just his own eye for uh, color and detail, but a lot of it, but, you know, he also was interviewing people and stuff. And I would say that to me is kind of like the sort of paragon of um, a story that was, that that had a huge emotional punch to it, but Hersey himself wasn't sitting there saying, and then I felt really sad when I saw this bombed out school. I mean, he didn't have to, he just described the school or he described, you know, these these kids who had suffered these grievous burns and that kind of thing. And so the the, the, the kind of emotion comes through in the power of, of the reporting. Um, you know, I think when Farnaz, the author of the Iraq email talks about it being emotional. It's actually, and I'd be happy to send a, a link to it. It's it's like published, so I'd be happy to send it and you all can read it. It's actually not, um, her, she isn't wearing her emotion out on her sleeve. Uh, she's just saying, this is what I see as a journalist. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you in the first person, not in the kind of distant third person. Um, and, you know, kind of like I said in my remarks, I'm sad, it's been almost 20 years, I'm sad that the journal, that, that she felt like there was no place for this in the Wall Street Journal. Um, because I think, again, with a little bit of editing and a little, you know, um, you know, a, a little bit of nipping and tucking, it actually could have run as a piece. And you will see first person pieces sometimes that are very effective. I would say in TV, it's like, at least in American TV, it's like very different. So if I'm, I'm guessing if you turn on an American network like CNN or, or NBC right now, a lot of it's going to be about, hi, I'm a reporter standing here and, and the bombs are going off and man, it's getting really close and the sounds are hurting my ears. It, it, I mean, the first person thing is kind of a much more accepted part of it. So. Um, I, I want to ask, oh, sorry, Kathy, but I, I want to ask you about Ukraine because when I'm <laughs> Whenever I see a big story like that happening, yeah. I'm just like the journalist in me just wants to run towards it. I just so want to be there and, and reporting. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, and but I do wonder how do we make those stories? You know, and as, as I said to you when we walked in, you know, but that's up there in that top part of the world. How do we make people care about a story like that down here in Australia when we we don't even have a, a reporter based in that part of the world? I think the ABC, the the Moscow correspondent was removed many. Oh, <laughs> okay. Someone's about to get on the plane. Yeah. Um, so how do how do we how do we get people to care about those big stories in a time when trust in journalism seems to be plummeting? Mm -hmm. It's an easy one for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really easy one. Thank you for that. Um, well, I think I mean as a practical matter, right now it's not going to be hard to get people to care because there, there there's a terrible war that's starting and a lot of people are going to get killed. A lot, of, a lot of lives are going to be upended forever, and so. Um, but I think, um, you know, uh, I had an editor who once said um, something along the lines of, "Stories that are work, you have a really, uh, if you use a telephoto lens to really zero in, or if you use a wide angle lens and you do it really broad, but don't try to mix the two of them." So, what does that mean? So a real telephoto lens might be somebody on the ground, this would be almost impossible right now, but somebody on the ground in say Eastern Ukraine describing what it's been like for the last few months as these tanks are, are like 10 miles away from their kid's school. 
or the factory where they work or something. You know, you know, you tell a story through a single person or a single school or a single business or something. That can be a really, really powerful vehicle for it. Or you can kind of go very broad and you can say, if Russia invades Ukraine, this is going to have significant effects, um, obviously, on the economy. People are going to care when the price of petrol goes up another 20 cents or 30 cents. Um, people are going to care when the supply lines, which are already uh, pretty tight right now, get even more constricted. So you, you kind of find elements of the story that people are going to innately care. I mean, you know, I see. I saw a story in the Sydney Morning Herald today about the Ukrainian community in Sydney and kind of how they're responding to it. That's, you know, that's kind of a traditional way of sort of doing it. And it can bring to light the fact that a lot of people in Sydney may not even know that there's a Ukrainian com community right in their midst and kind of how, how they're following it and stuff. So. Usually on Twitter, it's blowing up now, by the way. That's what was done. OK. Uh, literally. Literally. <laughs> Wait, and what's blowing up? Amazing footage of the Ukraine involved. Oh, really? You know, um, right, right. Okay, we'll, we'll get one more question, then we'll get back on the Twitter box. Right before the invasion, somebody posted um, a Google Maps um, thing of the roads leading from Russia into Ukraine and showed that the traffic had gotten really heavy <laughs> as all the tanks were coming in. It was at, 2.30 or 3 in the morning. It's kind of a weird thing. Sorry. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Janak. I'm a lecturer here. I do yeah, right. many uh, radio, television and podcasty type stuff. Um, I'm sort of picking up on uh, Jeremy's question about uh, um, yeah, where in journalism we can blend emotion and objectivity. And I'd like to argue briefly that podcast is probably one of the places where that's happening, where you're getting yeah that intimate voice, you're getting yeah. personal storytelling blended with reporting. Um, and I'm wondering, yeah, at whether the Wall Street Journal or from Columbia Journalism School, how you're seeing podcasting taking up space in journalism. And I feel like the two main modes are kind of like the New York Times daily type stuff, and then there's the long form. Yeah. But any other gaps you think that podcasting should be filling that it's not at the moment? Yeah. Um, do maybe you like to listen to podcasts? Are you guys, uh, you were talking about the podcast and not the broadcast, right? Podcast, yeah, yeah, sorry, it's the mask. Podcast with a P. Sorry. Podcast with a P, yeah. Sorry, with a mass. Yeah, 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 sorry. That's, yeah. Um, I mean, podcasts are just incredibly, you know, I mean, as it's kind of a very different kind of narrative storytelling, you know, it's because, uh, you know, some of these podcast series go on for 8, 10, 12 hours. So it's a real challenge to sustain a listener's attention for that long and i'm amazed by how effective a lot of them really are um and and honestly i never would have thought that that could happen because it's very hard to keep a reporter uh, a reader's attention for more than a thousand words in a story so how do you keep it for eight or ten hours i mean i think you're right i think podcasting very often they become not so much the story themselves but the story of how the reporter did the story so there's this one um, in the United States, the serial podcast um, that they did about a, a murder of a teenage girl in Maryland. You, you may have heard it. Yeah. And a, a lot of uh, the podcast is taken up with, re, with the, um, the anchor, the speaker talking about, and then I went to the courthouse and I talked to so-and-so. As a journalist, I found that really interesting because you can kind of see how she was reporting the story and trying to verify information and how she would get a conflicting piece of information and how she would process that. Um, it was hugely popular. I think it was the number one podcast, at least in, in the United States market and here too. And I was very surprised. I didn't think people cared that much, but I guess people love a story about a journey, you know, and it could be Odysseus trying to get from Troy to to is it Athens or the Peloponnesus? I don't know. Um, I was a classics major. I guess I should know that. But it's, it's, it's been a while. Um, or it can be a story about a reporter trying to get to the truth of of of, uh, of a horrible incident. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Um, I'm Kathy, and I teach here, but in the politics economies area rather than journalism. Um, and this isn't a practitioner question, therefore. Um, but I was really interested in uh, your, how you were talking about, you know, journalists as brands and the portable audience and 
I guess, the audience therefore not being as captured or not captured by news organisations. I was just wondering whether you had any thing to tell us about um, how the how the news organisations are therefore handling that handling that yeah. in in their in their hiring practices and you know their, their their staffing policies. Is there anything kind of more than just the number crunching? You know, I imagine there's quite a lens going on about who you recruit. Right. Yeah. Yeah, both who you recruit and what it takes to keep somebody on your staff when they start getting a, a large audience. How much are you reached? Yeah, right, right. Um, I think newsrooms are really having a hard time trying to grapple with it because at least traditional legacy newsrooms were very the top down. You know, it was what the editor says go, you don't like it, screw you. You, and, you know, especially a lot of places that say only had one newspaper in the whole city and you've got a house and a mortgage and your kids are in school, well, you, you like really can't leave. So you, you were sort of stuck there. And now um, I think individual journalists, um, uh, I mean, those who are talented at least, uh, actually have a lot more transportability, you know, partly because like I was saying, they can take their uh, audience with them, but also because um, uh, their own kind of individual contribution is much clearer to that news organization. So um, I don't know if any of you have ever worked in a newsroom that has something called Chartbeat or the Parsley in it. It's, it's, it's a website that keeps track of exactly how many page views every story is getting, um, where the traffic's coming from, what country, what state. Uh, it'll even tell you how long somebody stays on your story, which can be quite a sobering thing. Here, you just wrote a 2,000 word story and people only get 200 words into it and they're all bailing out of the airplane. So, um, but you know, in some newsrooms that becomes kind of a, a pecking order of its own, you know, that people can strut around and say, I've had the best read story every day for the last, you know, two weeks or something like that. And then the management kind of has to figure out kind of how do we deal with that, you know, because it might be the best read story, it might not be the best story. In fact, it's quite possible that it wasn't. It just got linked to by some high powered blogs or something like that. Now, I've heard from our graduates that that can be quite um, distressing when they have written something that's really important and some story about a headless chook is getting all the numbers. Um, we have a question from one of our online viewers, Bernadette Nunn, who's also one of our lecturers um, in the Graduate Diploma of Journalism. She asks, what challenges are there then for that training when the financial pressures on commercial journalism has seen a lot of training subsidised or funded by the social media giants, i.e. funding cadetships for news organisations? Is there a risk that the focus is on the algorithmic appeal of more provocative content for social and digital audiences rather than on solid journalistic training, fact checking and strong writing as a sub would do? Um. That's a really good question too. Um, so I would say uh, it's actually fortunate for journalists that some of the business model for uh, especially newspapers and news sites, not so much broadcast, has changed in the last few years. So a few years ago, it was very driven by the number of page views you could generate because you were very focused on advertising and 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 ad revenue was a multiple of how many page views you you could generate. So if your story if your story only got a hundred page views, it's probably going to generate twenty five cents or something or fifty cents. If it generated a hundred thousand page views, then obviously you can kind of do the math. And so there was a lot of emphasis in newsrooms to simply drive as many page views as you could, and that meant doing a slideshow about Kim Kardashian. Then that's what you would do. Um, what's happened in um, in the news business is the digital ad market is actually not very good. Um, and so more and more sites are going to subscription models, which I'm sure that you found as you try to read stories and keep hitting those walls. Um, and what they've generally found is, um, and I was just talking to um, uh, Gay Alcorn, the editor of The Age here in Melbourne just a couple hours ago. And she's talking about all their efforts to kind of drive subscriptions. And I was asking, what are the stories that drive subscriptions? And she said, really high impact stories, you know, stories that 
really make a difference in people's lives or covering a breaking news story really well. And I think those are things most of us feel pretty comfortable doing, right? Like in the news business, covering a big breaking story is fun and interesting and very gratifying. And obviously, you know, working on a project or a big feature story or a big investigative story. So I actually think that the the move from uh, ads to subscriptions, while it's been difficult on a financial basis for a lot of news organizations, has been um, uh, kind of a helpful counterpoint to that. And I would um, like to keep on going for several more hours. Okay. <laughs> However, I've only booked for the online for one hour. So right. on that note, we will have to um, wrap it up. Okay. There is a oh, tiny thank little thank you for us. Okay. Um, and, and please, a round of applause. <laughs> Your uh, questions were were really good. I mean, like <laughs> like you know, don't tell my students back at Columbia, but they were they were really really good. Awesome. Well, we would love to have you back uh, um, at another time. Sure. And okay. um, this was a uh, these are wonderful new students um, ready to start. Yeah. So uh, we're off to good start. Yes, yeah. it is. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone right, for thanks. coming. It was nice having you.